Bill Daubertine, Korea, 1952 to 1953. Korea, the Forgotten War. Bill served with the 1st Marine Division, 3rd Battalion in Korea with the artillery and infantry and was assigned to a machine gun platoon. Bill's story is very unique and inspiring. I interviewed Bill in Sturgis, Michigan, November 13th, 2013. Bill passed away in 2016, but his story lives on today. A very special heartfelt thank you to Joel Sauls for sponsoring Bill's story and making it possible for you to watch it today. Joel, I salute you, sir. Thank you for your help in supporting my work. I'd like to encourage those of you watching this video to consider sponsoring one of the many stories I've recorded over the years with my documentary series, Lest They Be Forgotten. If we don't remember, we're going to forget. There's information in the description under the video about how you can sponsor one of these stories. And on behalf of our veterans, their families, and our younger generation, thank you. And now I'd like to present to you the entire interview I did with Bill Daubertine in Sturgis, Michigan, almost 10 years ago. Thank you for watching, and God bless you. First question's a tough one. How old are you? 82. 83 in November. Okay. What year did you go in the military? 1951. And how old were you then? Do you remember? Uh, I'd be 21. Okay. You were a Marine? Marine. Boot camp, San Diego, or Paris Island? Paris Island. You remember that pretty good? Oh, yeah. I've been back here several times since then. Have you? Just on vacation, I had to go back and see the old stomping grounds. Now, you, you enlisted into the Marines? Yeah. Okay, there was no draft during Korea. Oh, yeah, it was a draft, but I enlisted. Okay. And you went through basic, and then you had advanced training somewhere? I went to Camp Lejeune. I was in the artillery section. And did you know that you might go to Korea someday? Uh, yeah, I knew I was going. Uh-huh. How'd you feel about that at the time? Oh, I just... Everybody was going. I didn't want to get left out. How about in school? Would you? Did anybody know anything about Korea coming and all that? Or no. So why do you think we had to go over there? Because that uh, after World War II, the, the, they divided up the country, and uh, communists took the north part and. South part, we had some army personnel there. And then the North invaded the, the South, and we had to go in there and push them back. And we stayed there for three years or better. So you were with the First Marine Division, I'm assuming. First Marines. What 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 other First Marines? Thirty-seven. What other what division or company were you with? Uh, this is Howe Company, Third Battalion, First Marine, First Marine Division. You see, it was an, it was an infantry battalion. So what what year what month did you get over to Korea? September nineteen fifty-two. And you stayed till the end of the war. Yeah, I was there at the end of the war. So when you got to Korea, was it like a culture shock? Or did you go into Incheon, or where'd you where'd you land? Well, we landed at Incheon, but we but the fighting was over there. It was up on the they had established the, the main line of resistance at the 38th parallel, and we got to the, at Incheon, and then we were divided up to go to our regular outfits that we were assigned to. I was assigned to the First Marines and. And then other people were signed where, where they were going, and we waited on the, on the beach there for trucks to pick us up and take us to our regular outfits. And so, you, all, every Marine's a rifleman first, right? I mean, right. Uh, so you were assigned to an infantry company? They were having a lot of casualties up there. And I got, I got uh, all, all at once I was a rifleman instead of being an artillery. 
So I stayed there for six months. As a rifleman? As a rifleman. I was assigned to machine gun platoon. Did you have a BAR? What did you use, an M1? <laughs> well, I got assigned to a carbine, but we had a machine gun, or a light, light machine gun in our bunker. So you were assigned to to lay. We went up on one, one, one deployment, we went up on the 76 Alley, it was called. And we had another bunk, we built another bunk and they brought up a 50 caliber machine gun for us with a telescopic sight on it. And we were supposed to snipe with it, we could fire a single shot. And we were firing maybe a mile and a half, two miles away at, at some of those hills. Pretty potent. So were you fighting the Chinese? Chinese, yeah. Um, Do you remember them attacking in hordes and waves? And were they? Did they ever attack in groups of waves of Chinese? <laughs> no, I never seen that. Yeah. They, they, uh, they, they made, it's probably the biggest, biggest wave they did was made of platoon size. And uh, just hilltop to hilltop. Well, t tell me about the first time you remember uh, engaging the enemy, the first time you're in combat. You remember the first time? Yeah. Well, where were you and what were you doing? What were you guys doing? Well, we was up on the trench line and there was a battle called a hook. Mm -hmm. It was right where the... <laughs> right where the... Im Chem River crosses into North Korea. And across the river right there was a British Black Watch Division. And uh, we was up there probably for two or three weeks. And they come over and relieved us. But the majority of the fighting was, was over. We, we were assigned, we, we, we moved up when the fighting was there, the, our company. And we could, we could hear the hype of the fighting, but they didn't engage us. Until, until the next morning, we went up, took our place on the bunkers, and we we stayed there, and just uh, most of the fighting had been been down, and the British Black Horse come over and relieved us. We had been sighting in on a, <laughs> on a log down the river down there all morning with the, with our M1s at that time, and we had it pretty well sighted in. And we made a bet with the British, we, we could hit it quicker than they could. Of course, they hadn't been sighting in on it. <laughs> and, and we beat them on that. But other than that, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Well, so you're there in September, you said? Yeah. So tell me about the cold. Did it get very cold where you're at? No. No? About like it was around here. You don't, you don't, you don't even think about it, you couldn't get away from it. You couldn't, you know, wherever you went, you, you, you was cold, you couldn't, you couldn't never warm up. Some, some places they had stoves where you burned diesel oil in them. Mm -hmm. When diesel oil was, was, uh, was hard to get for stoves. But uh, they worked with gasoline. We weren't supposed to do that, but... <laughs> to warm up, they're they're uh, they're awful hard to light. You gotta you gotta watch what you're doing. You're lighting them, or you're gonna blow something. How close did you get to the Chinese? Were you close, like we are here? Where they? I could smell them. Yeah. <laughs> but they could probably smell us too. How about at night time? Did you guys fight at night? That was the fighting time. We always had to be awake at night. Did you lose anybody in your company, wounded or killed during that time? Oh yeah, yeah. Were you with them at the time or? No. Yeah. That was always the right place at the right time, I guess, because most of it was our artillery fire that they fired at us, mortar fire. How about you, were you ever wounded? No. No, I was lucky there. So into 53, you guys were fighting. Was there, were you at Pork Chop Hill or whatever it was called? Or? <laughs> no, we were, 
I was at that uh, I was at the Hook. I was a place they called Seventy Six Alley, and on the other side of Seventy Six Alley, on one side of it, was the last fight in the war for the Marines. It was called Boulder City, and there was there a series of hills over there that were named after Vegas, Reno. Just like Ed Potts. We had an Ed. You know Ed Potts. Oh. Ed Potts. He, he was in the same two battles, the hook and what you're describing right now. I interviewed him on Monday. Uh, was, he, was, he, was he here in Sturgis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's 81 years old. He, uh, I don't have a picture of him, but... Yeah, Ed Potts. Same battles you were in. Lives out in Elaine Manor. He lives out there in Elaine Manor. Yeah. I have to get together with him. So tell me what? about the Nevada City, or whatever you're talking about here. Well, uh, that was the last fight of the war. And we moved up. We started, we was in Division Reserve at the time. And that, start, that started off and we moved one company up. And they, 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 they got shot to pieces. And I got a friend in that. I didn't know he was a friend at the time, but anyway, he got wounded and he was pulled out in the hospital ship. And I never run into him again. I didn't know I run into. I didn't know he was up there. But he, when we, when they, when McDonald's was bought out here, guy come up from Corpus Christi, Texas, <laughs> and he was telling me that he was a contractor. You know, at the time I was doing plumbing and they wanted some bathrooms changed around, I went out and talked to him and see when we could do it. He gave me the job and I told him when he was building it, I said, you got to insulate those walls because they get cold. He says, I never experienced any cold weather up here. I said, well, it gets cold. And he told me he was in Korea. I said, where were you at? He said, well, I was at Boulder City. I said, what outfit? Item Company, 3rd Battalion. I said, that's mine. Only at the time I was in Howe Company. <laughs> and, and we've been friends ever since. I've been calling him up every now and then, but he's back in Corpus again. He got shot up pretty bad, though. He got big chunks out of his arm and leg. He got hit with a mortar. But anyway, back to Boulder City. That was July 27th. It was hot, rainy, and that fighting had been going on for a little better than a week. And there's bodies laying all over, and the stench was just terrible. You couldn't get away from it. You couldn't, whenever you was eating, it was just terrible. And when the war ended that night, we were ordered to tear the bunkers down and pick up the dead. Well, the dead, some of the trenches were caved in and some people grabbed the body and pull them out and they'd pull a leg off or it was that far, far decayed in, that, in the heat of the day and, and stuff and they couldn't get at them to do anything with them because uh, fighting was so fierce here for that last week. But that, um, that, that was pretty good. And then 76, back to 76 Alley, I stood up there for two months. And um, where we was at on it, there was no warm meals because we, we, we were stationed on a point. One of the fingers on the hill, it was right down bottom level. Or the valley like where there's rice paddies and stuff. <laughs> and to get any hot meal you had to go up over the hill and and uh, they didn't bring it up except for maybe Thanksgiving and Christmas. And they'd bring it up and you'd sit on the ground and eat it. You'd take turns walking up there. But you had to expose yourself to do that. Because you're down the bottom of the hill, you got to go up the hill, and the Chinese were watching it. <laughs> but we we made it up there, and we get a few shots now and then. But nobody was ever hit. 
It was strange how that goes. We could, they uh, they would shoot mortars at us, and they'd bust up in the air, and they'd, leaflets would come down, and they'd, they was more or less communist propaganda. And well, you you know you can run around and pick them up, and they wouldn't shoot at you. That's what they wanted. They wanted you to pick them up. Then I guess, I guess give up. Nobody ever did. So when you're when you're engaging the enemy, are you are you attacking? Are you holding a perimeter? Are you in a foxhole, a trench? No. What are you doing? That when they attacked it, the enemy is when they landed at Inchon and pushed them right back to the Yellow River. When we established the 38 parallel, it was a defensive position and. When they came out of their bunkers and charged us, they got chewed up. When we did the same thing, then we got chewed up. So, so we just stayed. <laughs> but it was cold. You, you lived in a you lived in a hole in the ground and rats, a lot of rats. Because uh, <laughs> rats all over. And then we, we was up there and they brought us back the first year <coughs> from the Division Reserve. And they set up a camp for us back across the Yalu River. And they, the Koreans over there buried their dead, setting up, look, looking over the rice paddies. And mounds of dirt. And, <coughs> and then they set up tents for us, about 16 men in a tent. I remember the ten, the ten I got, the bulldozers went in and scraped shelves off those hills. Right over the body, they were right over the humps and everything. And they set up the tents. I was there for about a week, week or two. I kept seeing this ant. The ants kept coming, coming across the floor and down under my bunk. <laughs> I seen a little piece of white cloth. I what? One, I grabbed that and I pulled up a body, half a body I've been sleeping on for for two weeks and better. But I seen dog drag a bone around. I thought it was a it was somebody's leg. So I got a picture of a barber shop in there in that book. You see that? I got sitting there on a barber pole, got a skull on top of a barber pole. We had a battalion barber, when we come back and reserve, he always cuts everybody's hair. <coughs> Sounds like you saw quite a bit. Well, yeah, when I first got there, we went on patrol. We was back in reserve, battalion reserve, my outfit was. We'd go on patrol around these areas back of the hill, the main line of resistance. We was out there one afternoon doing a patrol. And we stopped along the way and have a cigarette. We sat down underneath this big tree <laughs> and it looked like we sat on something. <laughs> I got up and looked at what it was, a chestnut, it was a chestnut tree. And I'd been around chestnut trees before, and you got to step on them, get the nuts out of them. They're a prickly thing there. And I had a pocket full of chestnuts where we left. That's the chestnut trees over there, but ours all died off here in the States. I went down on one hill. I was standing in battalion reserve. You say you're going down the hill? I was standing in battalion reserve. It was a nice sunny afternoon. I went up and stood up at night. And there was a, I don't know, old temple or whatever it was up, up this valley. And it was a walled area, maybe. Could be 100 yards square. A big tree in the middle of it. And I went down. I went down there, I told the guy I was with us, I'm going down there and see if I get a shot at a pheasant. 
<laughs> I walked down there and looked around, nothing, nothing down there. So coming back, I got back and I had one of the little coffee that we made and made it over the sandbags and somebody come out of the bunker, come out of the, come out of that place down there and I just down there. We was right back in line. <coughs> what the heck is no civilian supposed to be up here? Well, I got my rifle out and I started sighting it in. And, uh, he got a little closer and I didn't see any gun. So I held up and it turned and took a path right up to us. <coughs> it was a line crosser, what they called them. They'd, Evidently, we let them go across, and we'd cross-examine them, see what's going on over there, and they'd do the same bad, same thing to stop when they got back over them. But it was a woman. We told the command post, and they come up and got her and cross-examined her, and I don't know what they did with her after that. But they all wear the same uniform. They're all that plaited stuff. <laughs> you don't know who's whom. I think in the summertime they just unbutton them. The rest of the time it's all bundled up. And I can see where it'd be warm. Well, the Korean War, the surrender was July of 53. July of 53. Was it the 26th or the 27th? Do you remember the date? 27th. Where were you during at that time? 27th was up online in Boulder City. Okay, I heard when they ended the war, everybody just stopped firing, and was that it? Um, How did you hear about the ceasefire? Did it come over the radio? Well, um, no, the Marine, Marines had the sector from the M, M. Jim River over to Pan Moon Jam. Every night, the searchlight, like they had World War II, them searchlights, they had one of them shining up in the air over Pan Moon Jam. And we were pretty well versed on it. We knew what, no, no, no fire in the minute. The, the minute that uh, war was over, they would give order to start tearing the bunkers down. So it, it ended that quick? Uh, Nobody shot at each other anymore? You were supposed to. <laughs> they didn't even want you to go pheasant hunting anymore. That's kind of hard to believe it stopped that fast. Mm -hmm. So what, the, the North Koreans surrendered or what? They never give up. It's still going on. Well, I know, but at that time, but we were fighting the Chinese, so, you know, the North Koreans were defeated. Yeah. So well, I think they were taking orders from the Chinese. I don't... Yeah. <coughs> so was that a happy time, or a glad time, or what happened at that point? Mm. Nothing. Really? We come back to the area and they start digging on what they call the Kansas line. <coughs> Main line of resistance, about a mile and a half back of the regular line, just in case it didn't and go go to the room. So after that point, what happened? Did you eventually go home event a few weeks or months or what? You no, know, you gotta stay till you're <coughs> Till the end. Did you ever engage the enemy up close or just from a distance? Up close to the distance. We were assigned to that 50 caliber machine gun. I, I'd search the area over there for any sign of, mm -hmm. of a hole in the ground or anything. And I was searching it one time and uh, that that one hill about way about a mile and a half away it looked like it could be a de depression in the ground and there was always a stick or something laying over the hole and of course those hills been napalmed and everything if there was any trees on them are all burned up and I sighted that machine gun in on that hole. So I looked out there one day and it was, that stick was gone. I figured somebody was sitting in that hole at night. 
And it took me about five or six shots to get that zeroed in on that hole. And we hung wet sad bags in front of the barrel because you fire that 50 at night and a lick of flame goes out of that about six, seven foot and then mark you right there. <laughs> Oh, about two o'clock in the morning, we touched one off. And we waited about five, ten minutes. I figured, well, they went out and got the body. Touch another one off. And the next day, we got pounded pretty good with artillery. I don't know if they were, somebody made somebody mad. They were trying to find us, but they never did. So I hear when you're in combat, you're fighting for your guy on your left and the guy on your right. Is that kind of what it's like in combat? You're fighting yeah. for survival, to, you know, for your buddy. You're fighting for your buddy. Yeah. Did your combat ever get that intense? No. You were you're all in a bunker together. Right or left or whatever, you're, you're, you're fighting for survival more or less. I don't know when you uh, when them artillery shells fire and you're doubled up in a knot. You don't want to. You don't want to come out. <coughs> we was watching them na napalm the when when hill over there. And the Air Force or somebody come up and do it. We always had our own air cover, but this time they we had them Corsair propeller driven job air airplanes with a gold wing. Something that was our cover, but the Air Force come up had. Jets. We watched them make a dive on one, and they'd make a dive, and then they'd circle around and come around again. They made a dive on the one hill, and they laid one out, and he circled around, and he cut her short. <laughs> I told the guy, I said, he's coming right down on us. And we, made, we, we drove the front door open the bunker, and he missed it. He up at the top of the hill, but it rattled our teeth, I'll tell you. They sent up, they, they, uh, I guess they sent up a bottle of whiskey for the officers, but we didn't see any. So how, how many years were you in the Marine Corps? Three. When you came home, um, did you talk about the war at all? Yeah. Did come home, went back to work. It was no big deal? You just come home and go back to work, huh? Yeah. Oh, hell, some of them people didn't even know I was going. It's kind of hard to believe, but I've heard that too. It's like, where were you? <laughs> I was in Korea fighting. <clears throat> but it, I, I tell you, it, it wasn't. I didn't see anything like well, that. That movie they made, uh, that Pacific. Uh, they made that. I, that 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 was something else. That we I, I never seen that. Yeah. So, it, 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 it might have been that way when they first landed in there in, in Incheon, but it was the last years of the war where it just trench warfare. It wasn't, uh, it was nothing like that. Uh, Are you proud to be a veteran? Oh sure, yeah, yeah. Is Veterans Day special to you or just another day? To be a veteran? Veterans Day, is that special to you? Veterans Day, it was Monday. No, not really. Do people ever thank you for serving your country? Some of them, some of them. How often do you get to tell your story like this? That's the first time I ever told it. So when you were asked to do this interview, what did you think? Well, I thought there'd probably be more people. He, he interviewed me at the time, but I don't know. Did you interview Jack Bargo? Has he been here? Yeah. Yeah. We went in the Marine Corps together, but uh, when we left Par Paris Island, him and another friend of mine went to. They went to San Diego to Camp Pendleton uh, yeah. to go to Korea right away, and I was shipped up to St. Camp of June. 
<coughs> and I went on two med cruises, making landings over in the Mediterranean on those islands over there, in uh, Sardinia and Crete and Malta. Made several landings over there. Went over there on two trips. And I think what was going on was mm, MacArthur was in charge of Korea. And uh, I think he wanted to invade China. Mm -hmm. And he got fired and then now all that dried up, that amphibious stuff. And then, then I got back to Lejeune, um, I, I got my orders to go to Pendleton. Went through a little combat training out there, and then we shipped over to Korea. Uh, so, did you ever get scared? I know that sounds kind of childish. Yeah. Did you ever get scared over there? Yeah. Well, I don't know about scared. Uh, uh, I guess I just I, I, I just hoped I didn't get hit. Well, let me ask you a question. I ask all the veterans this question at the end of an interview, but um, what does the American flag mean to you? You know, you're a veteran. You served your country. What does that flag mean to you? Yeah, I got a flag to hang out in front of my house. So what does it mean to you, the flag? It means the country. Pledge allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic of which you stand. <laughs> One nation indivisible. <laughs> Freedom and justice for all. I think everybody ought to say that, the school children and everything. They don't realize what a good country they're living in. Tell me about freedom. What does freedom mean to you? Do what I want. Not do what I want, but do what I can do if I can do it. The price, the price for freedom, you saw that over there. You saw people die for this country, right? And shed their blood. That's what we try to tell the kids in the schools, you know. Do you think it's important that our young people learn some of these stories? Yeah, I think so. I belong to American Legion and VFW. <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, they should, they should, they should know what's been going on from day one, I guess, in the country. It's important, huh? It's important to share it with them. Yeah, yeah they should have a good idea of what uh, should be taught in history. Absolutely. Do you think our country's forgetting some of these things, or it's a lot different today than it was back then? Oh yeah. World War Two. So I get all worked up when I listen to the news. <laughs> I start talking to myself. Me too. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do something. At the end of my interviews with the veterans, the older veterans, I, I always ask them to salute into the camera from where they're seated. When I ask you, could you do that for me? Could you do that? Okay, yeah, just look right in there and give us a salute. Perfect. Once a Marine, always a Marine, right? Right. I've interviewed hundreds of them. 
Well, we're going to take a picture with you now, okay? Okay. You stay right there for another moment. Greg and I are going to get into the shot here, and we're going to take a picture with you, if that's okay. Yeah. Ready, Greg? I'm ready. We've done this He's couple ready. things. This is where we get to say thanks and right on camera there. I'm going to shake your hand. Thank you for your service. Good. Happy Veterans Day, belated yeah, Veterans Day, and uh, we appreciate you telling your story to us today. It means a lot for us that you came out here today. We appreciate Good. you bringing them here today. We really do. So, um, let me get my little remote, Greg, and we'll take a picture. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to take a picture. <laughs>